Nursed by warm sunbeams and primeval caves, organic life began beneath the waves. Hence, without parent, by spontaneous birth, rise the first specks of animated Earth. That Ode to Evolution was written by old Erasmus Darwin a decade or so before Charles was born. The idea that creatures evolved had first come from the ancient Greeks, but it was explored systematically for the first time in the early 1800s. The French naturalist Jean-Baptiste Pierre-Antoine de Monet, Chevalier de Lamarck, published a paper proposing that all life forms originated from a single, simple organism. He claimed the variety of life was the result of species responding to their environment. To explain how this happened, Lamarck suggested characteristics acquired by a parent, highly developed muscles, for example, could be passed on to descendants. The only thing wrong with his theory was that it was wrong. We know now that genes control what traits are passed from parent to offspring not what the parent did during his lifetime. Darwin wore his walking path smooth, trying to understand the how of evolution. There were three elements in his theory. First, in the random shuffle of heredity, each individual is born slightly different from all others. All mammals, most animals, most plants, and indeed even many bacteria, have sexual processes whereby genes from two different parental lineages come together in a single descendant. So it's the uniting of, of, of inventions made in different lineages into a single descendant that seems to be the great thing that sex does for you. The second element is the cruelty of nature far more individuals are born than the world has room for. There is a struggle for survival. Some of those inherited differences coupled with an occasional random mutation will give an organism an advantage in the fight to stay alive. If brighter plumage is more attractive to the opposite sex, the fancier bird will have more chicks, who will in turn have fancy feathers. So the cruelty of nature fills the role of the horse breeder or the farmer. Nature carefully selects those life forms best adapted to the environment to live and to reproduce. It's absolutely vital to understand that Darwinism is a non-random process. Mutation is a random process. Mutation is the random change in genes which offers up in each generation the raw material for natural selection. But it's natural selection that actually makes life the way it is and gives it its quality of looking as though it's been designed. By 1842, Darwin's theory of natural selection was essentially complete. He wrote a brief outline and two years later expanded it into a 230-page essay to be published only in the event of his death. He had seen how the powerful Anglican establishment could hound, humiliate, and even jail those who denied God. Darwin was too cautious to publish, but too ambitious and proud to have his idea die with him. For 15 years, he collected and collated data supporting natural selection in his study at Down House. He wrote scientific papers and books, but kept his more speculative work a secret. After that, he was persuaded by his friend Lyell to sit down now and start working up uh, this book on species that he had been planning so long. What a shock it must have been when he opened the mail one day in 1858. Alfred Russell Wallace, a young naturalist collecting specimens in Malaysia, sent him a paper asking him to review an idea he had come up with. When Darwin read this essay, he was thunderstruck because it was his own theory of natural selection, as he himself said. Darwin quickly wrote a summary of his work and sent both papers off to be read to the scientists and naturalists at the prestigious Linnaean Society. Now Darwin started to condense his huge manuscript, condense it into what he called informally an abstract, 
and that became the famous book on the origin of species. Now that Darwin was going public, his fears of censure and damnation haunted him for the next 18 months as he tried to get the most important work of his life ready for publication. Well, those 18 months were murder for Darwin. Darwin was still afraid of persecution. After months and months of struggling, Darwin finally finished the last proof. He went all the way up to the farthest verge of civilization on the North Yorkshire Moors, and there Darwin was miserable. He didn't have his wife and his kids with him to begin with. Um, he tripped and his ankles swelled up huge so he could hardly walk. Uh, he had a fiery rash on his face. He developed boils. Uh, he said it was like living in hell. And what was he doing when he was there? He was writing letters to accompany pre-publication copies of The Origin of Species, to go out to all of the naturalists, the geologists, the old Anglican clergymen whose respect he'd cultivated for so many years. And his letters were peppered with phrases like, you will not approve of your old student. You will abhor what I've written. You will fulminate anathemas. You will long to crucify me alive. The first printing was sold out the day of publication. Darwin was startled to hear that copies were being snapped up by commuters at Waterloo train station. The press saw through Darwin's attempt to downplay the evolution of man, and his long white beard quickly became an icon in magazines. From religious conservatives came the expected charges that the book was atheistic nonsense. From the scientific community came high praise and occasionally the equivalent of, why didn't I think of that? On June 30th, 1860, the controversy came to a head at a debate before the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Bishop Samuel Wilberforce attacked the Darwinian view. Biologist T.H. Huxley supported natural selection. Before 700 people crammed into a stuffy library, the bishop asked Huxley whether he was descended from a monkey on his grandfather's side or his grandmother's. Huxley whispered to a companion, the Lord has delivered him into my hands, and then stood and told the assembly that he would rather have an ape for a grandfather than a man who introduced ridicule into a scientific meeting. Arguments over the origin of species are still going on, from church pulpits to graduate school seminars like this one James Moore taught at Harvard. It's an ape book, isn't it? The people at the time saw monkeys running through the pages, or apes, I, mean, I don't think he had any sense that he could write a book like this and not be writing about human beings. I think he was canny in terms of, of not addressing it directly to his descent of man. But I think this is absolutely about the central, you know, sort of the National Enquirer headline that his, current, his contemporary readers would be coming at this about. Is, okay, what does this say about us and God? Mm. Is, is there a correct reading of Darwin? Is there a correct reading of any text? There's no other 19th century work of biology to which uh, contemporary biologists, scientists working today, would go back in order to see whether they could learn something new. In the history of biology, it's difficult to conceive of a greater book than The Origin of Species. It fundamentally, and I believe permanently, changed our view of nature. We live in a world of Darwinian principles. We need a new flu vaccine every year. Pesticide-resistant bugs are devastating crops. Cholera, malaria, and tuberculosis are coming back. The AIDS virus changes so rapidly, drugs stop working. We have encouraged the evolution of resistance to the very antibiotics we want to use. It's extremely irresponsible, careless, and stupid of us. And if well, it, let's put it that way. If all doctors learnt some evolution theory when they were in college, it might have saved a great many deaths.